This series of videos introduces the 38 chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. It's a project of the Social Change Lab, and we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Mary Lee bequest for the work of our team. Hi, everyone. My name is Winifred Lewis, and I'm a professor in psychology at the University of Queensland. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Zung. I'm a psychologist and a research assistant in University of Queensland. Hi, I'm Uchi Leo, a UQ psychology student. And we're working today on the recordings for all 38 chapters of the Environmental um, Handbook of Environmental Movements, the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. And today we are talking about chapter 20 called From Environmental Movement Organizations to the Organizing of Environmental Collective Action. And this was written by Mario Diani. And um, Professor Diani is, as I alt tab to my notes, um, Professor Diani is a professor of sociology at the University of Trento. So to begin with, this distinction in the title may not be like very intuitive to a lot of viewers, but basically Professor Diani is talking about the difference between focusing on organizations or actors in the environmental movement uh, compared to focusing on the relationships and processes that link the actors together. So, um, you know, that's pretty an important distinction because almost all of the research on the environmental movement and how people normally think about environmental movements is by thinking about individuals or groups. So, um, for example, what are some thoughts that come to your mind about individuals in the environment movement, Yuchi? Yeah, so like in the individual levels, like researchers often just uh, try to search the individual background, for example, like their culture orientation and their political ideologies, as well as their kind of religious beliefs. Yeah. And their, uh, their values and their attitudes, yeah. you know, those predict um, who's likely to support the movement. So it'll be like if you have these biospheric values, then you're more likely to have pro environmental behavior. And um, people also look at groups, don't they, um, Andrea? Yes, they do. So there's quite a diversity of environmental organizations, and uh, they all kind of matches the profile of like being environmental friendly and doing collective actions to um, kind of protect the environment. And uh, those groups kind of have different um, priorities on their um, action content, and uh, they all have a claimed share identity. And uh, this um, aggregative approach kind of see uh, environmental, um, like environmental movements as um, being der derived from the aggregation of properties of these units that could yeah. be uh, so included. If, if I was gonna jump in, because I think some of that language is probably not familiar. It just means aggregation here just means putting everything together. So, you know, if you have three environmental groups, you know, Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund, Extinction Rebellion, then the movement is those three groups. So you're just putting them all together or aggregating them. Go ahead, yeah. Andrea. Yes, and kind of adding, their, uh, adding them up, um, including their specific organizational formats, their action repertoires, and also their conceptions of the environmentalism, then all adding up together to form this um, concept of environmental movements. Yeah, so it's like for repertoires, that just refers to what actions or tactics the groups take. So, um, you know, if one group might be lobbying governments and another one is having blockades, when you add that together um, in this approach, that's what the author's criticizing. You're saying, well, the environment movement is blockades plus advocacy. Yeah. And really, the um, way that he thinks we should approach it is in terms of relationships and links, because you can have the same people in the environment movement at two points in time. But at one point they're cooperating and another point they're fighting. And that's actually a totally different movement. Or yeah. it could be like, there's these groups and they're all the same groups at, at one point in time and they're working together. And then at some point they split and they go in opposite um, camps and factions. And so he highlights that unless we look at the relationships between individuals and between groups, um, we're not going to get a good representation or understanding of what's going on and where the movement is and where it's going. So what are some ways that people have studied the relationships between individuals, Yuchi? Yeah, so like researchers often 
find that like the individuals would be impacted by their parents, by their yeah. teachers, also by their employee or employers. Yeah. And, the, and there's uh, many other like the interactions between them, which might influence themselves. Yeah. Especially friends, right? So like, yeah. if you say like, why did you come to this protest? Oftentimes it's like, well, my friend asked me to, or my friend told me about it. So these friendship networks turn out to be really meaningful. Um, and what about relations between groups, Andrea? Yes. So there are quite a um, quite a quite a lot of like intergroup interaction within the environmental movements, and some groups um, that might have a different priorities on their contents. Like some may more focus on like uh, animal rights, and the others um, against forest uh, forestation, deforestation, and uh, on a smaller scale, they might. Those group might um, um, action on kind of take action on their own, but when they um, kind of come together um, as a share, like having a shared identity of environmental activists, they are um, they transform from a smaller identity to a more um, shared identity, and uh, on this. Based on that, they could uh, exchange resources and also strengthen their connections. Yeah, that's right. And sharing the information and sharing money uh, can also flow outside the named environmental groups. So there's some very interesting original data in the chapter where the author highlights that in a big collection of um, groups that were active in a particular city, there were uh, a subset of them, about a third that were environmental groups. But out of the other groups that were not identified as environmental, there was um, a huge number of them that also were taking action on environmental causes. So groups like unions or um, feminists could send money or support environmental causes. And similarly, environmentalists can support anti-racism or um, stand up for peace. So those relationships among different causes, as well as um, different groups within a movement can be about sharing information, um, sharing resources, taking action together, forming campaigns, and um, sharing identities. And what they really highlight is that um, those different types of relationships being stronger or weaker makes a, a difference for the movement, right, Andrea? Yes. So um, the connections between different groups kind of fluctuates um, within time. And um, a best, a best example is the New Zealand environmental movement that kind of draws a huge success in the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, after that, this um, there is a decline in their contentiousness, but at the same time, we can also observe there is a growth of the local and community-based initiatives. So this is really about the balance of how um, when the ties um, become stronger, and uh, there is a weaker um, diversity in this um, connections. But when there are um, the ties between different groups are weaker, they might um, enjoy a large diversity and yeah. may connect to different groups. I want to jump in there because I just think that's such an important and interesting point. So it's like the tighter the groups are working together, the more pressure there is on each other to be similar. So it's like, I can work closely with you because we're very similar to each other. But if you're very different from me, that creates tension and that can lead to a break in the network or the movement. Um, whereas um, when the ties are a bit weaker, um, larger coalitions who have less in common can work together. Um, but it's also about that, that difference in scale from the local to the national level, um, right, Yuchi? Yeah, so like the national levels uh, organizations uh, can be sometimes be pressed by their government mm. if they are not like democracy country. Mm. So this time they probably need some kind of cooperation between the international group and the national group, which help these national groups to thrive yeah. and to be more uh, like to be more like larger. Yeah. yeah, and have those resources as well, like local groups that might be trying to advocate about pollution they can put the word out through international networks when they're being ignored by their own national government. And we've seen that um, a lot in the environment movement. It's been really important. Yeah, I think that's an important point. 
I guess another um, point that the authors get to in the chapter is um, about um, all the different movements within the environment movement, some of them are related to completely different social networks. So for example, within the environment movement, there are networks of scientists that have been really important in bringing information in and spreading it and getting it out. And there's also other organizations like we talked about unions, but also religious networks. So within the environment movement, there's heaps of religious groups that are active um, in different cultural contexts and they might be connected to each other. And so looking at how all the different networks connect is gonna be important in understanding where the opportunities are and how groups can function and um, looking at it at all different levels, like what you just said. There's another point that I wanted to make um, uh, around the author's provocative suggestion in the conclusion that we can also look at networks as not just linking individuals and groups, but even linking um, things like symbols to each other. So for example, a symbol of the environment movement might be the polar bear on the iceberg, um, but that has limited, and that could connect all the Northern countries that really understand and relate to the image of ice. But down here in Australia, um, those, those that doesn't have resonance, but a symbol like the blue planet, um, our earth is something that can connect all the environmental groups of the world. So looking at how the symbols do and don't connect um, different aspects of the network, I find that very provocative and interesting. I guess if I was to say um, how I feel about the chapter, it's probably one of the ones that's most um, interesting to me professionally in terms of linking to the work that I want, that I'm trying to do, connecting individuals and groups and networks. I didn't even know that people did this work until I read the chapter and I was saying to um, you guys earlier, this is like going, wow, someone had this cool idea and they've already done it 15 years ago, yay. Um, so we'll, I look forward to diving deeper, but I love this chapter, it's so fun. How did you guys react to it, um, Yuchi and Andrea? Yeah, I really enjoyed this chapter because um, it really focused on how joint membership is very important um, in the environmental movements. As you just said, like someone who is pro-environmentalism may also pro-human rights and they may also um, activate in like, um, attend like political events and uh, I think this um, chapter really emphasized on how like we don't see, um, we see environmental movement as a whole instead of separate individuals, separate organizations or separate events. And it is, what is important is that the interdependence of all these um, separate units kind of um, has a tie that we need to strengthen and uh, we have to um, share resources, share information, and that, that kind of strengthens the ties between and be kind of be build a stronger networks. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I really relate to that. Um, and Yuchi, you were, you were nodding along there. Oh, yes. Like, I'm really being attracted by this chapter as it just told me a very, like, famous idiom that quotes from the UN that, uh, united we stand and divided we fall so like yeah. how we cooperate with each other and like how group cooperate which is uh with each other is so important and how they like to this resolve the dispute to make the cooperation more successful is also this is what i learned from this chapter yeah that's really brilliant Okay, well, we might um, finish on that inspiring note. Thank you, Yuchi, and thank you, Andrea, for being part of the recording. And thank you to our viewers if you've made it to the end of the video. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. For those of you watching, be sure to subscribe and follow us at Social Change UQ. And check out our website for more videos.